You are either here for one of two reasons this evening. Either you really hate football or you really love Jesus. So well done. What? You love Jesus. See, that's what I'm, I like to hear. Um, I am also in the camp of not hating football. Life is not fair is the theme of our sermon tonight. And the first thing I thought, I, I kid you not, the first thing I thought when John told me, you're preaching on July 15th was like, you know that's the final of the World Cup, right? Like, we're having church that day? So we are continuing on with Ecclesiastes, and although I make jokes, I'm excited about where we are in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's been a wonderful, a wonderful series, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but here before the Word of God with you this evening. Uh, We have learned a lot over the past nine weeks, a lot of different challenges, a lot of different conviction, a lot of different confusion from the book of Ecclesiastes, all good things that cause us to stretch and explore and further understand what the Word of God is trying to communicate to us, trying to conform us into. And uh, the same thing happened this week as I was reading through Ecclesiastes 8. And as I was reading it, I was asking the same question that we've been asking of all of the chapters, all of the verses that we've been going through in the book of Ecclesiastes, and that is, Lord, what does a life full of meaning look like? And I'm glad that we've been asking that question because the tendency to focus on in Ecclesiastes is the word meaningless, vanity, non-significant, unimportant. And so I appreciate the fact that we're looking at the flip side of the coin because I think that's what Solomon, directed by the Holy Spirit, is trying to communicate to us. All of these things are meaningless. All of these things under the sun don't have importance. But week after week, God has taken our attention and shifted it upward and said, these things indeed are meaningless, but I have things that are meaningful for you. As I was reading chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes, I felt challenged, and to be honest, this is a bit of a difficult week for me because the second half of the sermon are things that I'm struggling through dealing with in my own life, things that God has been calling out in me, even today. And just as he has every single week, he's putting us into place. He's giving us perspective that we desperately need, and when I say us, I'm talking about me first and foremost. We'll get to the chapter, the verses that we have for this week. First, I want to uh, give you what our main idea is. And I wasn't kidding. The main idea of this week's uh, sermon is that life isn't fair. But beyond that, life is full of meaning when we enjoy the unfair, undeserved gifts of God. The unfair, undeserved gifts. Gifts of, God, gifts of God. And we'll see what that means in just a few moments. First of all, let's pray, and then we'll read through our main passage for the evening. Dear Lord, we come before you this evening because we want more of you, because we recognize that you're not done with us yet, because we recognize that there's so much more in this life that you have for us, and that it could be even more meaningful, lived even further to your glory. So God, this evening as we come before your word in Ecclesiastes 8, we pray that you speak clearly to us that you call out things in our lives that need to change, that you direct us, that you encourage us and comfort us where we need it. But above all, we just pray that we hear your word. Not my words, not our own thoughts, not the comments of the person to the left and the right of us, but your word, first and foremost, above all else. We have open ears and open hearts. We pray that you open them even wider to receive your truth. We pray all this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes 8 if you have your Bible or your cell phone or your Google glasses or whatever the young kids are using these days to read their Bibles. I say that because I'm, although I'm young, I'm the least hip person in the building, I assure you. So I bring a nice paper Bible and we're going to read out of Ecclesiastes 8 verses 9 through 15. The context of this verse, verses 2 through 7 that is, uh, is Solomon talking about a harsh ruler or um, a ruler who is a tyrant and whose word is law and is unbending. And so that's why he says what he says here in verse 9. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Again, there's the tyrant. Then he says, then too I saw the wicked buried. So all these people that he was just referencing, the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. 
Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. Verse 14, there is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. I tend to enjoy sharing messages from the passages that cause me to stumble most or the ones that I read through and can't quite understand after a first or second reading. And this passage, uh, in the same way, was one of those. And the reason that I enjoy that is because usually if something catches my attention and makes me scratch my head a little bit, I know that it is God calling something out in me, God identifying something that I need to explore further. And so, when I read through eight and nine, I knew that this was the message that God would have, at least for me this week, and I know for all of us as well. But the reality is, as I read through it, at least in this translation, it was a bit tricky, and I wasn't quite getting the point. I wasn't getting the intention of what Solomon was trying to say about what the Word of God was communicating. And so I want to read another translation to you. I'm going to read the exact same verse, but in a translation that helps me see exactly what Solomon was trying to speak in chapter 8, verses 9 through 15. So I'm going to open this up here in my phone on the New Living Translation, and we'll have it on the screen behind you. And this is how it goes. Solomon writes, where are we? See, this is why I use a paper Bible. You don't know if you swiped left or right, and then all of a sudden you're in John. You're like, what the heck? Verse 9, I have thought deeply about all that goes on here under the sun, where people have the power to hurt each other. I have seen wicked people buried with honor, yet they were the very ones who frequented the temple and are now praised in the same city where they committed their crimes. This too is meaningless. When a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it is safe to do wrong. But even though a person sins a hundred times and still lives a long time, I know that those who fear God will be better off. The wicked will not prosper for they do not fear God. Their days will never grow long like the evening shadows, and this is not all that is meaningless in our world. In this life, good people are often treated as though they were wicked, and wicked people are often treated as though they were good. This is so meaningless, so I recommend having fun, because there is nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. That way, they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun." And after reading it in that translation and spending time thinking on Ecclesiastes 8, it occurred to me that Solomon was simply agreeing with the sentiment that I have felt and learned from childhood and that all of us have learned from the very beginning of our lives that life is not fair. Life isn't fair. And it's something that we learn very early on. I remember a specific instance where my mom cut a piece of cake for my brother that was slightly bigger than mine. And you know what? I was not having it. I was like, Mom, what in the world is going on here? Why does he get a bigger piece than I get? That's not fair. And you know what she said to me? Life's not fair, fair, Nick. Thanks, Mom. Appreciate that. But see, I wanted everything to be measured by the same standard. I wanted everybody to get the same exact thing. Or if not, I should get the bigger piece. I was the older child. It just made good sense. And we learn very early on that things don't always go according to the way we want things to go. We don't always receive in this life the exact thing that we feel like we have earned or deserved or are entitled to. And it's something that Solomon is picking up on here in chapter 8. Something that he's playing on. Because he knows every single one of us, including myself, need to deal with this entitlement that we feel. The sense of fairness that we should get what's coming to us. And so he says in verse 10, he points out this, opera, uh, this, this situation uh, where the wicked are applauded by the very people that they are harming. And then he says the wicked are buried. He's alluding to the fact that the guys that are doing harm to the people, the rulers that are tyrants, the rulers that are going into the city and doing and affecting and carrying out these terrible laws and oppressing their people, they're the very ones when they die that are honored and buried and given monuments and praised. And he says, life just isn't fair. That's just not right. 
They're not getting what they deserve. Then you look at verse 14, and the, the reason that I went through and read the whole thing again and read it in the NLT is because I love what it says there. The good are treated like the wicked, and the wicked are treated like the good. And Solomon's saying, as I look around at my friends and my companions and the people around me and even myself, perhaps, I see that life just isn't fair. People aren't receiving what they've earned. They're not getting out of life what they deserve. And it's something that not only I see with my pieces of cake, nor that Solomon saw with his various court officials surrounding him, but something that all of us see in our everyday lives, something that you, I'm sure, have experienced in recent history. It's always the person that lies and flatters their way into success that gets the promotion. Life just isn't fair. It's always all the losers around you that are getting boyfriends and girlfriends and fiancés and spouses, not you, the faithful, kind, and affectionate catch that you are, life just isn't fair. It's the person that bullies their way to the top that gets to be captain of the football team, not the person that serves hardest and works like a team player. And so this morning during the 12 a.m. gathering, 12 p.m. gathering, we were not here at 12 a.m., trust me, during the 12 p.m. gathering, as I read the verse about the, why, uh, the wicked being treated like the good and the good treating like the wicked, everybody, I mean like 70% of the audience was like, mm-hmm, because all of you know, all of you have seen and experienced the fact that life just isn't fair. People don't seem to be getting what they deserve. People don't seem to be getting what they earned. But the reality is, that might not be so bad as it sounds. Let's continue on a little bit in the in the passage, the passage highlights the fact that we react or tend to react to unfairness in one of two different ways. And I appreciate the way that uh, Ecclesiastes 8 pulls this out. Uh, the first way we see in verse 11, let's read it again rather than me paraphrasing it. It says, when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. It's that quick, almost knee-jerk reaction that you have or that thing that you think when you see the person next to you in your office who's an absolute jerk get the promotion. You think, well, if that person lied and flattered and kissed up to everybody to get a promotion, maybe it's time that I lie and put on a face and pretend to be whoever they want me to be so that I can get a promotion. It's you looking around at all the people in your life, all those losers that are getting those dating relationships or those romantic relationships that you want, and you say, well, if they got that person, maybe I just need to lower my standards a little bit. Maybe I just need to compromise on my morals a little bit, and then finally I'll get something that I was wanting. If this person was able to bully their way into a position of leadership, maybe it's time that I start intimidating people so I can get what I want. This is exactly what Solomon is saying here. He's saying, these people are seeing that the evil, the wicked are getting away with what they're doing and they're thinking, why can't I get away with it too? If I, or if they cheat and steal and lie to get to the top and to get what they want, then why can't I? If they can get away with it, why can't I get away with it? That's the first way we tend to react is conforming to that pattern of unfairness. The second thing we tend to do is not necessarily explicitly stated in the scripture, but it's implied in our own reaction, and it's implied in the emotion and the sentiment that Solomon is really playing off of. Again, let's look at verse 14. It's that verse talking about the people being treated the wrong way. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth, it says. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve, this too, I say, is meaningless. Again, it doesn't say what our reaction is, but the reason it doesn't say is because it doesn't need to say what our reaction is. I would say the majority of the time we react in this second way, not in the first way. And the way that we react is we hear that and immediately we want to say, whoa, what is going on over here? This is not okay. Somebody needs to get over here and fix this mess. We call for retribution. And we say, look at all the, the junk that this person is doing and all the things that they're getting out of it. Somebody needs to get over here and solve this problem because that is absolutely not fair. You think of the person that gets the promotion and you hear them or you see them having their conversations in the break room and you think somebody just needs to call them out on all of their pretenses. Somebody needs to put that right. Somebody needs to make this fair. And you demand there to be retribution or punishment or something to be fixed. 
You look at the person on your Facebook page that is in that relationship that you really don't think that they deserve because, again, they're not a catch like you are. You say somebody ought to tell their partner that they should not be with that person because that is just not fair that they got stuck with them. And we say, we got to set this right. I, we got to call down retribution on this because this is not fair and it needs to be fixed. Everything needs to be equal. Everything needs to go as according to plan and the people that do what they do should get what they deserve. Ironically, even, those are the two reaction, even though those are the two reactions that we tend to have, scripture really guides us into doing something almost completely the opposite. You look down at the end of the passage that we read in verse 15, and it talks about enjoying life. After talking about all this fair unfairness around us and the meaningless that Solomon highlights in it, he says, so I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better, so on and so forth. My initial thought was, you're kidding me, right? The wisest man on the earth in this time and in this period, his best advice is just, you know, Ignore it and enjoy your life. I said, clearly he is not aware of what the unfairness around me looks like. Because I can't just stop fixating on all the problems and all the unfairness around me and enjoy the things that I have in front of me. So I went back and forth and I read the passage over and over again, prayed through it and read commentaries because it just didn't make sense. But then the Spirit called my attention to the verses or I'm sorry, to verses 12 and 13, and to a little detail that I had overlooked, something that I thought was a side note. And do you ever do that when you read scripture? You're reading through something really encouraging or challenging or whatever it may be, and you're highlighting the whole thing. And then you get to a paragraph that doesn't really fit with everything else, and you're like, well, we'll just skip over that and keep highlighting. That was this, this, this chunk of verses for me this week, 12 and 13. I'm going to read it to you again because it's key to understanding how we're supposed to respond to unfairness and how we can get to the point that Solomon is bringing out in verse 15. So starting in 12, it says, Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. This verse, I realized, connects the beginning of the passage that we read and the end of it. It gets us from a point of unfairness to enjoyment by fearing God. But the problem is we like to skip over it. Because when we, re when we read fear God, it makes us a little bit uncomfortable. And what we tend to do is we say, okay, this passage says fear God. Now, I just want everybody to understand that fear does not mean fear. Fear means respect. Fear means awe. Fear means wonder. And all those things are true. But if we really want to understand what Solomon is encouraging us to do in this passage, we have to take Scripture for what it really means. Allow it to speak for itself rather than us putting a bunch of caveats on it. Fear of God is not solely respect, although it is that. It's not solely reverence, although it is that. The fear of God is a sobering moment of realization in which we understand who he really is, who God really is, and all his holiness and all his power and all his majesty and his might and his infiniteness and so on and so forth. And as a result, who we really are by contrast. Well, what does that have to do with unfairness? For me, most profoundly when I think about the fear of God, the most profound feeling that I have or the biggest disparity that I see, the biggest moment of fear of I have, uh, that I have is when I consider how holy our God is and how messed up I am. Sorry, your preacher's not perfect. How holy he is and how sinful I can be. And so what Solomon is doing here by encouraging us to fear God, by leading us into the fear of God, is he's saying, I'm trying to put you in your place. Because the reason that we, or the reason that you're feeling this unfairness, or the reason that you're reacting to this wrong is because you are not seeing this clearly. And so I'm trying to put you into place. Nick, what do you mean? Let's go through this real quick so that we can understand what he's doing. When you begin to think about the fear of God, when you experience the fear of God, and you see who God is in relation to you, all of a sudden, 
Fairness and retribution don't seem like such a good idea. Again, as I said, as I ponder the holiness of God, the goodness of God, and what I can be by contrast, all of a sudden, getting what I deserve doesn't seem like such a great idea after all. Solomon, God through his holy word here in Ecclesiastes 8, they are putting us into our place. He was putting my, me into my place this week. And as I read that and as I understand what the fear of God does to us, I began to think of verses from Romans. So we're going to connect the second half of this message with the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we're going to flip ahead to the book of Romans. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead to uh, chapter 3. And we're going to hop around a little bit. But these are the verses that the Spirit began to call to my attention, that I began to recall as I was pondering the fear of God and thinking about my place before him and thinking about my own demands for fairness and justice and rest retribution on everyone else around me in my life. And God took me to a verse that we've all heard a thousand times in Romans 3, and I'm going to read it, although you know it. It says this, Verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in that loving yet painful fatherly way, God says to me, hey, Nick, all have fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous, not even one. Not even you, Nick. And so all of a sudden, as I'm demanding fairness and retribution on everybody else in my life and that everybody gets what they have coming to them, I realize that I fall into the very same camp that I have divided them into. I created these two groups of all the bad people doing their bad things yet getting good things out of it and all the good people doing the good things and getting their bad things out of it. And God says, guess what? There's no divide between those two groups. It's one group because all have fallen short of the glory of God. I thought about it a little bit more and I found myself in Romans 6, verse 23. Again, a verse that all of us know that we've heard preached or we've heard taught or we've seen on a billboard, maybe not on a billboard, that would be a bit extreme. <laughs> seen it somewhere. For the wages of sin is, go ahead. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, Nick, God says, do you really want everybody to get what they deserve? Do you really want everybody to get what they've earned? He says, you fall in the camp of no one is righteous. And within that camp, all have earned death. When we begin to see God for who he really is, when we begin to fear him, we very quickly understand that we do not deserve to enjoy life with him. We just don't deserve it. Yet somehow for our own benefit, strictly speaking, by the definitions that we have conjured, God is not fair. at least not in the sense that he does not give everybody exactly what they deserve. He does not give everybody exactly what they've earned. And it's beautiful. And we should be grateful for it, for that thing called mercy. It's all mercy is, is God choosing not to give what he should have given us. But then he takes that mercy one step further we read about it in chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. The 
Apostle Paul writes, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And in the most unfair moment of all of history, the Savior of the world, the sinless Son of God, died for the sins of you and the sins of me. And he does something incredible. He looks at us, washed by the blood of Jesus. And in the most unfair, undeserved thing he could do, he says, righteous. You are righteous. That's what justified means. God, looking at you through the blood of Jesus Christ, as you stand in faith in him and saying, you are righteous. And when we understand that, when we truly get the grace of God, we understand that life is not fair, but neither is God. And we don't really want him to be. As I read this passage, as I began to think of its connection to Romans, the link between Ecclesiastes 8 and Romans 3, 5, and 6, I could hear God saying, be careful about griping and about comparing and complaining again about the disparities that you see all around you. Be careful about complaining about who has what, about who has received what for doing what. Be careful. And I say, God, but look at this person over here who is lazy and rude and doesn't do what they're supposed to do and they are wealthy and they are happy and they are fun. And he looked at me and said, guess what? Life's not fair and neither am I. And while you're focusing on all the wealth and the happiness and the free time of this person, you forgot about the abundant riches that you have in Christ Jesus. And I'm sitting here saying, Lord, you gotta fix this problem over here because they just are all messed up and this is just not okay and I am not okay with this and you need to fix this. And God said, what about what I've done to fix you? That wasn't fair either. I took on flesh and I died for you. And every time I get to this point of the message, I just can't hold it together. Because the God of the universe in all of his holiness and perfectness saw fit to come and die for someone who cannot get their life together for someone who always finds a way to mess things up. And I know you feel that just like me when you consider the grace of God and you say, God, I don't get it, but I'm so grateful for it. The grace of God is completely undeserved and it's so unfair, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm not saying ignore all the injustice around you while you think about grace. Look, scripture calls us to help the poor, to stand up for the marginalized and to be there for the widows and to be there for the orphans. What I'm saying is this is what God says in his word. Don't fixate on the unfairness of life by comparing your situation to that of everyone around you. Instead, rejoice in what you do have. More specifically, enjoy the abundant and eternal life that you have in Christ Jesus that, by the way, you and I did nothing to earn. Nothing at all. And in fact, everything that we did do earned the exact opposite of what we ended up with. Returning to Ecclesiastes 8. Give me a moment because I lost it in my Bible. Well, I can paraphrase it. Solomon says, so I commend this to you, the enjoyment of life, to eat and drink and be happy, to 
have some joy with all the work that God gives you under the sun. And I just, even considering it for a third time in the same day as I preach it, I just, I can't believe it. Because it all makes sense then. You begin to see why and how it is possible to enjoy life in the midst of all the unfairness around you. Because when you put yourself before God and begin to see who he really is and who you really are, you cannot help but notice that you do not deserve to even be in his presence. But still, there you are by his grace and his goodness and his love that would not give up on you. And all of a sudden, all the unfairness around you begins to disappear. And you can no longer focus on that person over there or that person over there that's getting what they don't deserve or that person that's getting what they do deserve but should be getting more or that person or them because you realize that you have received so much, everything in fact, and did nothing to earn it. And so rather than sitting griping about the person that got the promotion, all I can do or all I should be able to do if I'm focusing on the fear of God and the grace that I have in him is enjoy the work that comes to my desk and have fun with the coworkers that are around me. And I, I can't help but look at the relationships around me and think I trust in God and know that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from him himself, and he has it in my good timing and in his good timing. And I can't help but think about my sports team and that jerk of a captain as a leader and think how much he needs grace extended to him in the same way that grace has been extended to me because the reality is I have not been treated fairly in this life and I wouldn't have it any other way. And as you begin to understand that, you begin to extend that grace to everyone else around you. And you know how the problems of unfairness get fixed in this world? The same way they got fixed in your life, by grace. And so as we live and embrace the grace of God and understand who he is as we fear him, we begin to extend that unfair, undeserved love to every single person around us. And all of a sudden, that jerk of a captain is being melted. His heart is softening by the love of God. That person that always put on pretenses is understanding that God loves them the way that he created them. And rather than putting on pretenses, he has it in his mind to conform them to the image of Christ Jesus. And all of a sudden, the love of God emanates out from us. Why? Because we received life in the most unfair and undeserved ways. But our life is full of meaning when we really, truly begin to enjoy those unfair and undeserved gifts of God, those undeserved graces of God. Let's close in prayer this evening. Speaking first of all to those of us in the room that may be saying, I have never actually accepted this gift of grace this unfair gift of life. And I recognize that I need it. Look, you're in the same boat that I'm in. We need the grace of God. So if that's you and you say, I want the grace of God. I want to accept that gift of life that he has for me. I want a new life. I want a fresh start in him then I challenge you to just put your hand up right now to acknowledge that, saying, I want the grace of God. I accept that gift. If that's you, put your hand up and down. Amen. All right. Okay. And then maybe there's some of us in this room this evening that would say, I believed in Jesus, followed Jesus. But the reality is I haven't understood his grace as fully as I would have liked to. I've been fixating on all the unfairness around me and the bitterness and the anger and the selfishness has been festering inside me to the point that I feel dead. But I want to start again. I want to embrace that grace, that new life, that fresh start that Jesus has for me once again. If that's you, put your hand up and write back down. So for those that have raised their hands and for all of us together, I want to say this prayer in unison, a prayer that all of us, including me, need. So 
Just repeat after me. It goes like this. Lord Jesus, I need you. I need your grace because I am full of sin. I need your love because I have been in rebellion. I accept your gift of life and with joy proclaim that I will follow you. I will eat, drink, and be merry. For you have given me a great gift. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to allow us to close with some time of personal reflection this evening. I believe that's what I dropped on the ground. Yep. Some time for us to pray, to take these questions before God, to consider what the word has to say to each and every one of us individually. So I'm going to give you two questions to help guide those thoughts and prayers. The first is this, am I obsessed with fairness and retribution or do I embrace and extend grace? The second question is, have I ever really enjoyed the internal, the eternal life I have in Christ or have I wasted my time fixating on what others receive in this life. Take that before God in prayer, and then we'll close.